I am now going to call to order our Innovate 680 Policy Advisory Committee, also known as the PAC. Um, this is actually our 13th meeting of the PAC, but this is the first time we up here have all been together. So it's kind of fun. And so, Tarian, because we do have viewers at home, please go ahead and play the video. This meeting will be conducted as a Zoom webinar to allow for public participation and comments. The Contra Costa Transportation Authority does not condone hate speech in any form. We continually strive to make life better for all members of our community and create an atmosphere where everyone feels a sense of safety and belonging. We ask that anyone who wishes to speak does so with civility, respect, and kindness for others. Citizens will have three minutes to speak. It is requested that public speakers state their names and organizations, but providing such information is voluntary. Citizens participating in person wishing to speak should submit a public speaker card to the clerk. Citizens participating by Zoom wishing to speak should use the raise hand feature or dial star 9 if participating via phone and the chair or staff will call upon them at the appropriate time. Written public comments received in accordance with the teleconferencing special notice on the meeting agenda will be provided to the members. If authors of the written correspondence would like to speak, they should raise their hand in Zoom or submit a public speaker card and the chair will call upon them at the appropriate time. All written correspondence received after that and during the meeting will be entered into the record. Thank you for participating in a meeting of the Contra Costa Transportation Authority. Okay, and after that exciting video, Tarian, will you call our, our roll call? See who's here. Member Carlson? Here. Member Haskew? Here. Member, Her Member Testa for Hernandez? Here. Member Obringer? Here. Member Perkins? Member Stepper? Here. Member Storr? Here. Vice Chair Nowak? Here. Chair Anderson? I am here. Okay, we do have a quorum with members Foley, Ren, Ross, and Stor uh, Perkins absent. Okay, well, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, let's start out with public comment, and this is the opportunity for anyone to speak on any item that is not on tonight's agenda, but under the purview of this committee. And Terry Ann, do we have any written public comment? No written public comment. Okay, is there anyone present in the room who wishes to come up and speak to us? I'm not seeing anyone jumping up. And is there anyone online? No public verbal public comment. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. And now we are, we've got one item on our consent calendar, and that's the approval of the minutes from February 8th. And do we have any changes, comments from committee members? Not seen any. Um, any public comments on this? On, on the minutes? And I'm assuming no, Terry Ann. <laughs> um, no, any, no public comments. No public comments. Okay. Anyone in the Sorry. room who wants to talk about the minutes? Okay. And anyone online? If not, Karen, is that a motion? I keep hearing you. Sorry, I, I didn't know you had 10 people to ask. Yes, I'd like to move the approval of the minutes. Okay. No, second. Thank we you. have a motion by Stepper, a second by Sue Nowak, and we will do a roll. Well, I guess we don't have to do a roll call because we don't have anyone participating remotely. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any we're, opposed? Um, Chair Anderson, we're still conducting roll call votes. Are you still doing roll call yeah, votes even we, though, okay, you, however the, yeah, the authority we, wishes to do it. Would you please call the roll call for the votes? Okay. Member Carlson? Aye. Member Foley is absent. Member Haskew? Here. Uh, uh, aye. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> <laughs> Member Testa? Here. Member Obringer? Aye. Member Stepper? Aye. Member Storr? Vice Chair Nowak? Yes. Chair Anderson? Yes. Okay. Motion passes with members Perkins, Ross, and Foley absent. Okay, thank you so much. We are going to move right into our regular agenda items. The first item for discussion, it's informational and will be presented by Stephanie to provide an update on our Innovate 680 program and project. So, Stephanie, go ahead. Thanks, um, Chair Anderson, and welcome to our first in-person um, Innovate PAC meeting. I'm just happy to see you all in person. Um, 
So our first item is the usual um, updates for you all about what's been going on with the program of projects. Um, the program goals you're very familiar with at this point. Oh, we do. Someone who's trying to get in. Okay. Sorry, Stephanie. That's okay. I'll continue on. Sue is our sergeant in arms, and she was. <laughs> oh, it's. All right. It's not a board member, so or PAC members. So I'll continue. Um, the program is a performance-based program, as you know, and our goals are to improve safety, connectivity, efficiency, and reliability on it, I-680, and also preparing the corridor for the future, um, providing accessible mobility options to our users, encouraging mode shift, and improving air quality along the corridor. These are the six projects. I won't belabor them at this point. You guys are all fam very familiar. Um, so these are our updates for our six projects, and I'll skip some of them that are going to be an actual formal item that are happening later in the agenda, such as the express lanes, which I'll come back um, in the next couple items. Um, for part-time transit lane, we've completed the planning document um, under the Caltrans process called the um, project initiation document that was completed last year. The next phase, which would have been an environmental clearance for implementation on 680, is currently on hold while we um, focus our effort in testing and training at Gomentum Station. And CCTA has um, completed a consultant procurement to get consultants on board to help with that effort. And so we'll be convening the working group in April um, or May to start that work. For Mobility Hub, staff is finalizing um, procurement documents, actually, to get a consultant on board for design and environmental clearance for two hubs, the um, Bollinger Canyon Road in San Ramon, and also the Martinez Amtrak Station. Um, and then for, uh, specifically for San Ramon, we are working with staff at the city to determine the location at Bishop Ranch 3. And we did get a preliminary confirmation from CalSTA, who is providing um, TIRC. TIRCP funding for that hub. And go. I'll skip ADS because there's a formal item in the later part of the agenda. For Moss, as you know, there's a pause on the project. We've been reported on this for the past couple meetings. Initially, the pause was really to um, work out the trip planner software on BART, on BART side. And while BART has come back and said that the issues are now resolved, um, the project team has chosen to continue with the pause, mainly due to the um, exit of AAA, who was helping with the car share component. So while they uh, work out the strategy on um, how to replace AAA and formulating that strategy to go back to the FHWA, they decided to pause and to save budget and not to um, and it's just really saved the program or budget for the project in order to implement what they need to implement um, for the app. But they do feel they are on target to um, pilot the app later this year, hopefully in, in mid-2024. For advanced technology, there are two projects or sub-projects. First is the Coordinated Adaptive Ramp Metering, or CARM, which will be the next item, so I won't spend time there. But for CATS, which is the Coordinated Adaptive Traffic Signals, we are in the process of gearing up for another round of one-on-one -on -one meetings with local jurisdictions, hoping to do a possible demonstration project, um, gearing up for um, future funding, particularly SMART, which would be um, appropriate for this type of scope, um, and then just be ready to have um, like scope to be applying for that demo corridor project. So this slide shows sort of our, it is our program schedule um, looking out. Um, we have a lot of projects under Innova 680, and it may seem that we've been in planning stage for a while. We've been meeting actually 16th time. This is our 16th meeting, and all of that was just really for us to get the project started on the right, right foot. Um, we've developed the program concept of operations, seeking your input to see how to implement this program as a whole, and the discussions have been really helpful to help us piece the projects together and how to implement the program. So we're excited that we're at a point where we can say we are in implementation. Um, the yellow, yellow bars on the map or on the, on the schedule is the project development phases, which is um, planning and environmental clearance. So in 2024, you see some green and blue bars, which denotes design or um, operations. So for CARM, you'll hear in a second, we will be 
starting design for segment one pretty soon, and um, the environmental clearance will be wrapped up in, in this coming month. For Share Mobility Hubs, just mentioned that we're procuring design consultant. The Presto shuttles under ADS will be up and running later this year. Um, Express Lane is planning to release an environmental document in May and hoping to select a preferred alternative in the summertime. And then part-time training, uh, part-time transit lane is being training, trained and tested at Gomentum Station this year. And then the app, as I mentioned, we're hoping to implement that or release the pilot of that app mid-2024. So we're just excited to be at a place where we are in the implementation phase and just appreciate all of your input so far. And we'll continue to obviously bring back our projects to you to um, inform you and also get, continue to um, gather feedback. That's it? Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, that is no, no, it. Yeah, there's not enough wealth of information there. Um, now, we are going to be discussing some of these things in greater detail, but I'm going to start out with everything that Stephanie has presented so far. Anyone on the committee have any questions, comments so far? Okay. Not seen any. Anyone in the audience, do you have any questions or comments? I am not seeing anyone jumping up. Okay, online, do we have anyone, Terry Ann, who wishes to comment, or, or did we receive any written comment? I'm assuming not. No written or verbal public comments. Okay, so we are going to now move on to our next informational item, and it's going to be presented by Darren Henderson and Scott Patera to provide an update on our Innovate 680 Advanced Technologies project. So welcome. Now, before you go on, do you want us to ask questions as you go? Or, okay, I'm, because one question I do have starting out, because you've got two different agencies working on this, how in sync are the two, or are you going to describe that? What are the differences? Yeah, um, let's defer that one. Okay. We do get into a bit of detail on the full Terrific, thank you. Vehicles onto the freeway when we need to, so additional lane capacity. 
Um, we're also installing um, upgraded vehicle protection in the corridor. Um, the particular device that we're using is called a turtle. Um, it's a, it's a, a LED um, device, light device that detects that when the wheels of the vehicles cross um, the light plane. There's actually two demonstration sites already on Innovate 680, so in case you didn't know it, you've been driving through these for the last like three years. Um, one's at North Main and the other one's at South Main. They're both on the southbound side of the freeway. Oh, sorry. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you don't do this in person very much for the last like and four years and you do it good. online. Um, so, uh, so those devices, as I said, there's, there's two examples out in the field, and you can see the photograph in the top there is the North Main site. Um, that's the receiver for one of the turtle pairs that's located at that location. Um, we'll also be, uh, or CCTA will also be um, providing the operations and maintenance support for up to the first three years of operation um, while the system is being tested and proofed. Um, that will give the opportunity for CCTA to coordinate with Caltrans on the ongoing O&M responsibilities after that three-year demonstration period. One of the key elements of the project is it uses a, a traffic management platform called Streams. Um, that is a comprehensive uh, traffic management system. Uh, specifically for CARM, it incorporates what's called the Alinea Hero suite of algorithms. Uh, unlike other um, ramp metering systems, it actually uses a, a variety of different algorithms that are looking at different aspects of operations on the freeway and on the ramps. And it uses that information every 20 seconds to update the ramp metering rates. And that's what allows it to differentiate itself from other um, ramp metering strategies that you may have um, encountered in the past. Um, basically what it's trying to do is to optimize the mainline flows along the corridor so that we can avoid oversaturating a bottleneck and causing it to break down and to become congested. Because if we do that, we lose a lot of productivity. We can move much fewer vehicles through that bottleneck once it's congested. So the longer that we can sustain flows, the more productive we can allow our facilities to be. At the same time, it is monitoring the ramp performance to make sure that we're not getting excessive queuing, excessive wait times on the ramps. I know as local communities, you're very concerned about the effect that ramp meters can have backing up onto your arterial streets. One of the key features of this particular strategy is it is monitoring that very closely so that it can avoid that impact. It can avoid having traffic back up onto your streets by adjusting those metering rates to ensure that it's working. And it does this because all of the ramps are working together as a single system. So they're not working in isolation, it's looking at it at a systematic scale, and all of the ramps are working together to help each other out. If one is becoming overloaded, the others can step in and take more of that load. So in terms of progress on the project, um, CARM segment one is going through the PAD process as we speak. Um, we've got a variety of draft documents with the department um, in anticipation that they will be approved um, in the next couple of months. Uh, they've been through several cycles of review, so we're getting very close to uh, having that completed. Um, in addition to the standard documents, the uh, plans, the, the decisions, uh, the des design standard, the DSDD, the design standard decision document, um, and the draft project report, um, we're also having to prepare some additional documentation, such as a ramp metering policy exception memo. Um, that is because we are uh, not including HOV priority lanes on the ramps as part of the CARM system. Uh, that is an exception from the Caltrans standard, so we are requesting that exemption, exemption to be applied. Um, and we're also developing a design responsibility matrix. Back to Chair Anderson's question about the coordination between the projects, that's one of those responsibilities. We're making sure that all of the, the responsibilities for the design, for the implementation, are being divided accordingly between the two agencies. The environmental technical studies are basically all complete. Um, we are doing some additional uh, soil boring and testing at the moment um, to, to accommodate some last minute uh, adjustments to the design that are impacting some different locations. Um, we expect that the CECE will be issued in the spring, uh, so within the next couple of months. Um, and again, that will allow us to then move forward into subsequent phases of work. Um, it is also supporting uh, a couple of grant applications that we're pursuing to help fund the project. 
And then finally, we are in the, we've, we've wrapped up the development of the systems engineering documents, both the concept of operations and the systems engineering management plan. Um, those drafts were submitted to the department back in at the start of the year, and we're in the process of responding to some final comments um, in anticipation of those being approved by Caltrans and FHWA. And then finally, um, because we are using specific elements that are were predetermined, um, we need to complete a public interest finding for the use of streams and for the use of the turtles. Um, that is in development, and we're expecting that that will be in draft form to the department pretty soon. I alluded to it just a moment ago, but we are um, very hastily working on putting together a couple of grant applications, and I see a smirk from Stephanie over there who's been in the throes of that. Um, we are working very closely with Caltrans. Uh, they will actually be the, the grant um, applicants on one of those programs. The, it's called Congestion Relief, and it's part of the uh, infrastructure bill that was uh, developed a few years ago. Um, Caltrans has to be the lead agency on that particular application, so they are working very closely with us at CCTA to ensure that we get the necessary information into the application, and we're very close on that one. It's almost ready to go. And then we're also working on a mega grant um, for different aspects of the project, and that one's being led by CCTA. Um, and again, as we've talked about, um, there will be continued coordination with Caltrans throughout that process. Um, to make sure that the two projects are being coordinated appropriately and we're avoiding those redundancies and overlap. And on that, I will allow Chair Anderson, to, I think, to introduce Sean, or do I need to do that? Well, either way. I yeah. can do that? Okay. Okay, why don't you go ahead and do that? So I'm going to invite question. Sean Desari from Caltrans District 4 to step up and uh, give his presentation, but I see a question before I... Okay, do, before do we that. move on, let's do see if anyone else yeah. has questions. Karen. Sure. Um, it, I can't tell you which intersections because you told me for Bollinger, Crow Canyon, Sycamore, and Olympic. But I'm thinking of those ones later that cross over and how does that complicate what you're doing here? When you have lanes that cross the, over getting onto the freeway like at Diablo Road, for example. Um, okay, so there, uh, all of the interchanges in the corridor will actually be ramp metered as part of the project. The remaining ones that I didn't list are being done as part of the Caltrans shop project. So the ramp meters will be put on at those locations. The ramp metering itself helps, of, helps to minimize that conflict that you're talking about. Um, we're also doing some additional improvements at uh, Bollinger Canyon and Crow Canyon, okay. where we have the loop and the direct ramp very close to each other. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to consolidate those into a single ramp meter okay. so that all of the traffic will get released together, and that helps to minimize some of that conflict that we're seeing at those locations as well. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll now pass it over to Sean. Uh, we, hold, hold on, Darren. you you got to sit, or oh, sit right. next to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got I had a couple of questions as well. Um, so the turtles, are they far enough back on the ramp? Is that what gives you an indication of, of backup on the, on the ramps? Uh, no, the, the, the turtles are on the main line of the freeway. Oh, okay. Um, so they're spaced roughly every third of a mile along the freeway, so they're quite frequent. Yeah. Um, they give us the information on how the freeway main line is operating. We'll also have loops installed on the ramps. Um, Caltrans does that as part of their normal ramp metering. Um, that includes a back of queue loop detector, so we know when the traffic is pushing too far back. Okay. Um, for CARM purposes, we also install an additional loop in the middle of the ramp, like halfway down the ramp, and the system, the algorithms in CARM actually read the traffic that's passing each of those points and is able to more accurately estimate where the queue is, how much traffic is waiting on the ramp, so we don't actually have to wait until it gets back to that back of queue detector that then becomes like a, a worst case scenario kind of a situation. Okay. Okay. So it allows us to really accurately estimate what percentage of the ramp is being occupied and what the wait times are, and that allows the algorithms to respond accordingly and to make adjustments if we're seeing queues build past a certain point. Right, so the algorithms are making those adjustments. It's yes. not somebody watching this. These That's are correct, it all happens paid. automatically. Okay. Yeah. All right, that was, that was the other. Um, to that point, though, there, there, there will be active monitoring of the system yep. during the operations. So there will be eyes on the system all the time when the ramp metering is operational. The algorithm's doing all the calculations and making all the ramp meter adjustments. The, 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 the um, manual intervention is there if there's an emergency situation or we see that the system appears to be misreading information or something like that so that we have the ability to override the system if, in fact, we see there's an anomalous condition occurring. Right, and going back to, thank you, the other, the other point was, you know, the 
back up onto arterials. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we talked about that a lot yep. in, in previous meetings. Yes. Um, but I don't recall that Caltrans was going to take that over after three years, honestly. I think that's – maybe I well, it, missed that, but I, I thought that was – It is a – it is a – to be determined. Okay. Um, part of the, the strategy of doing that initial three-year deployment yeah. is to allow the department to observe how the system works and to make a determination on whether they – feel it will fit into their existing structure okay. or if they need to ramp up staff or do some training okay, or something like great. that. But ultimately, um, as we get towards the end of that three years, probably around the 18 month to two year mark, um, CCTA and Caltrans will have some, some very deep and meaningful discussions about yeah. how the system is performing up until that point and what ongoing operations and maintenance of that system might look like. Uh, and ultimately enter into an agreement about what that will what that will be moving forward. Yeah, not that not that you know Caltrans couldn't do it very well. I just I, I, it's just new. It was new information for me, so I was <coughs> hearing something um, different. And so in the areas that you're doing in segment one, have you contacted the local uh, cities that are on that to talk about you know to be aware when it starts? Will you be communicating with them so they can say hey? Something's, something's yes, gone not awry to, here. <laughs> not to tread on Danielle's toes, but um, oh, okay. <laughs> we've, we've definitely been engaging with the local communities as we've gone through the project development process. And as Stephanie showed you on those slides, that's been yep. happening for the last few years. Okay. So there's been one-on-one -on -one meetings with those specific cities, um, as well as the general meetings that we have with right. these committees um, and the TAC uh, to get down to sort of the technical level. Um, we also fully expect that as the pro project starts moving into design and certainly as it gets closer to bidding and construction, that there will be additional rounds of outreach both through these committees to all of the region and then specifically to the cities that are affected so that we can discuss with them exactly what's going to be happening within their communities, what the construction is going to look like, how it might impact their communities, et cetera, so that we can get that out to the public. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Or did I take all your questions? Oh, no, it's great. Very okay, Robert, it looks like you've yeah, got no, a question. Thanks, thanks for the report. Refresh my memory. I know we've talked about it some long, long time ago, these algorithms. We borrowed it from another community or somebody else is using these algorithms. Where was that at? Yeah, so the, the concept was actually developed in Australia um, by the Victorian Department of Transport and Planning in Melbourne, which is a large metropolitan area in Australia. Um, Actually, the, the Alinea Hero algorithms, which are two of the suite of algorithms, they were actually developed by the Technical University of Crete um, in Greece. Um, that was done many, many years ago. Uh, the Victorians then adopted those algorithms as the basis for their coordinated adaptive ramp metering system and have put a lot of intellectual property into enhancing them and developing additional capabilities and have added additional algorithms that look at other components of the traffic operations. So the entire suite has been developed primarily by the Victorians. So we've actually watched this system evolve, learn the fatal flaws, and then brought that back home. Yep, there's a lot of experience. Maybe on, not quite bulletproof, but certainly very effective. Yeah, that's a, that's a very astute observation. Um, yeah, there's definitely been a lot of, uh, there's, there's hundreds of, there's 100 miles of projects in Melbourne that operate yeah. this system. Um, 200 ramps or something like that. So it's a very significant system in their metropolitan area. There's other communities in Australia. We also completed a pilot project in Colorado and uh, representatives from CCTA, uh, Caltrans, um, visited that project and saw how the system was working in that environment yeah. um, using the same suite of algorithms and a lot of the same technologies that we're going to be using here. So it's definitely a proven concept in other parts of the world and we're looking to, uh, uh, and I will mention that um, RCTC, one of your uh, peers in Southern California, um, they actually have a project that's already been awarded for, con for construction, mm -hmm. and they will be under construction later this year and operating their, their similar CARM system starting towards the end of next year. Mm -hmm. So there'll be also experience from California um, to bring to the mix as well. That sounds great. I just didn't want you to work the bugs out in Danville. That's all. No, that's all the, I, here. I can't Thanks, promise Robert. that there won't be any bugs, but uh, the majority of the bugs have already been worked out by, by previous uh, entities. Riverside County Transportation Commission in Southern California. Yeah, the Inland Empire of Southern California. Okay, any other questions? Then let's move forward. Thanks.
please go ahead. Sean. Good evening. I'm Sean Lazari. I'm South Bend Radio Network Influencer for the Authors Group. And thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, as already heard from Derek in my presentation, my name is Derek Daniel. I'm a PhD student with the Duke University in the Learning and Participation and Literary Community. What we have in this lab is how to implement literary and that takes place. So uh, let me go to the next slide. I'm here to give you um, a little background about metering, also tell you how our shop project that uh, lays out the infrastructure for metering on 680 and then how it fits with uh, what we are doing on 680 with the CARM integration. So metering has been a proven strategy throughout California and the United States. It serves basically two purposes. One, it improves mobility overall within a long segment of congested freeway corridor. It also helps with reducing crash risk. The merging that takes place at the freeway on ramps is going to be a lot more safer with a regulated flow of traffic onto the freeway. So come closer, okay, very well. So um, certainly, based on the FHWA documents that we've had and our own experience in California and Bay Area, we have proven um, you know, records of improved mobility and improved safety. Uh, ramp metering reduces congestion by regulating the flow of traffic onto the mainline freeway. It controls the traffic volumes so that we can address the downstream bottlenecks uh, within the uh, freeway segment. It breaks up the platoons of vehicles trying to enter at the same time. That's why we get a more regulated flow uh, throughout the corridor. And at the same time, it gives us an opportunity to um, promote transit service and promote carpooling, which is, again, <coughs> part of the solution. No one uh, strategy is going to address all of our uh, traffic congestion in Bay Area and metropolitan areas. We have the demand side that we need to address through transit, through uh, expanding transit service and also uh, improving our carpool facilities so people can actually ride share. Do we go to the next slide? Can we move into the next slide? So, uh, I mean, oftentimes, you know, we've had challenges in implementing metering because as we mentioned earlier, there are many different communities involved and there are always challenges in proving the effectiveness of uh, metering. Um, in Bay Area, we started metering in Santa Clara County some 30 years ago where we had the most of congestion. Over the years, congestion has increased. We've done different things to show communities that metering actually works. The very first uh, test of that was uh, actually not in California, it was in Minnesota, where the first metering project was implemented and the communities weren't too happy with the initial uh, implementation. And I can assure you, that's been our experience every time we've uh, implemented metering. In every corridor, when we initially uh, activate the meter, there is, uh, there, is, there is challenges, there is complaints, there is detours that impact the traffic flows on the locals, but within a week or two, we are able to address those. Again, with the help of our local jurisdictions and everybody else that's involved. In Minnesota, they did the test. They said, okay, we turn off the ramp meter. They turned off the ramp meters for two weeks and uh, they found that the crashes actually increased again, speeds were reduced, so, and travel time reliability was lessened again. Uh, and we've done similar things in Santa Clara County back in the days when we implemented Highway 85 metering. We had a similar, excuse me. Okay, there you go. All right, so, and metering has been evol evolving, you know, just like uh, initially we talked about, you know, we are taking the latest, greatest things that we find in CARM 
but it started with a very simple process of figuring out what time of the day traffic is the, at its highest levels and how we can manage that traffic. So we came up with time of day tables to set the metering rates. Well, that was kind of the old day, old ways uh, of doing it. Later on, we come across the changeable rates that we have. Uh, we, we came up with the local responsive uh, strategy to meter uh, the traffic. And these are, again, based on predetermined rates of traffic entering the freeway, rates of traffic on the freeway. Nowadays, elsewhere in Bay Area, we've come to a proactive strategy that we call adaptive ramp metering. It's one step behind CARM in that at every ramp meter, we have detection that tells us what the demand is there. At that same location, we have detection that tells us what's the freeway uh, demand, and we try to manage that at that location. What CARM does adds more detection that allows us to weigh the metering rates along the entire freeway. So we can uh, set the metering rates in a, a lot more uh, intelligent ways. So we think CARM is gonna be uh, better than um, our adaptive ramp metering system that we have, even though it was uh, developed in Australia and they drive on the wrong way up the road, but that's okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't hold that against them, sorry there. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> So uh, in Bay Area, we've, uh, we've had, we have uh, five to 600 meters already implemented. Virtually all of our corridors have metering to some extent. The, the slide that you see shows Highway 4, Santa Clara 17, Solano 80, throughout the Bay Area. There are two corridors that we don't have metering. One of them is 680, the other is uh, Morin 101 in Morin County. So, and as you see, our, our, our way of implementing metering, unfortunately, wasn't the best way to start because we've never had dedicated funding to implement metering. We've always been able to uh, address uh, our needs for metering through other projects, pavement projects, widening projects. So every chance we got, we put in meters uh, in that area within the limits of that project and over time when we had enough meters to meter a long enough corridor, segment of the corridor, we implement it. And that process usually takes us, you know, once the, all, the in, all the infrastructure is in, it probably takes us about a year to go through the process of developing the metering plan for the corridor. And again, that's done in close coordination with the local county, all the communities within the project limits, and uh, you know, that, that way we've been successful. With 680, we were very fortunate in that we were able to get state funding through Senate Bill 1 uh, that was dedicated for operational improvement, a project like this. So this is a unique opportunity for us to have come here, be able to bring your $100 million project to implement metering throughout the corridor like 680. We've never had that anywhere else in Bay Area. It's always been in pieces. So uh, back in two, uh, 2020, 2020, when we got the Senate Bill 1 funding, we were able to program this project that covers the entire 25 months on 680. From the county line in Alameda on 580, north of 580, all the way to Solano County and 780 uh, freeway there. It's about 36.4 miles of fiber optic that we're gonna add throughout this corridor that helps us with uh, getting the detection information, uh, the CCTV camera, data, the, uh, all the elements that we put along the freeways like changeable message signs that we activate to inform motorists about incidents and special events. All that information needs to come to our center in Oakland through a communication line. For the most part in Bay Area, we rely on modems and uh, you know, uh, internet. Now with fiber optics line, we have direct connection to these elements. They're gonna give us real time data. They're gonna give us uh, very good uh, quality of data. Uh, we, we are going to include the 51 ramp meters uh, in the project, 25 northbound and 26 southbound, nine closed circuit television cameras, two changeable message signs, and the detection stations. 
Again, overall cost is about $100 million. And uh, we, we would be ready initially when we had this project and weren't working on CARM, we would have uh, initiated the project with a local responsive strategy, which is the easiest way to do it. But given that we have CARM, we can stage that. So in coordination with the 680 Innovate team, we uh, rethought that project. We split it in two phases. Uh, phase one would cover the segment uh, from, again, north of 580 to, uh, to south of 780 along the 680 corridor. Uh, it puts in the majority of the infrastructure that we need for metering. Uh, so that CARM can come in later and integrate with them and operate the meters. At this time, uh, this phase of the project is 65% complete for design. Uh, we are sh shooting to deliver it in June of uh, 20, this year, 2024, and expect completion of construction in 2027. And uh, we would be able to activate the meters in 2028 but again, we want to be in sync with CARM, so we're going to hold off on that until we are all ready to go. Uh, again, this, this, this project, this phase, installs the mid-ramp uh, queue detection that we normally use for adaptive metering as well. Okay, so we also included the phase two of the project when we split the project, the original project, so that we can better uh, coordinate with CARM. So in this segment of the project, we come in and put in some additional 14 on-ramp locations that weren't installed in phase one uh, from northbound 680 uh, to Al Costa Boulevard uh, to Olympic Boulevard. And we complete and deliver along with CARM in 2028. And that's when we would be ready to initiate metering. So our current plan is to deliver the shop as we expected the shop project phase one. That's gonna be, uh, design is gonna complete in, in June this year, uh, construction in 27. We would be able to activate the meters, but rest them on green. There would be no cycling, there'd be no stopping. It would be allow the uh, motorists to become used to the idea of having meters without having to change any, any of their traffic uh, mm -hmm or, or uh, any of their trip, uh, uh, any, any of their travel. So, uh, and then by then, this, the CARM project segment one is going to be ready in early 2028, and we'll work with uh, the CARM consultant, Darren and his team, and be able to activate the meters in that segment of CARM that you heard about earlier. And we use that experience to get the rest of the corridor metered when we have additional funding through, um, through various means of uh, funding programs that we have, again, utilizing CARM. And, you know, we continue working with uh, uh, the I I680 uh, Innovate team. We're evaluating the feasibility of other widening that would allow us to better uh, operate the corridor. Uh, our our research and innovation uh, division in Sacramento is evaluating the turtle sensors and detections that Darren talked about. We wanna make sure that's something that uh, can have a statewide application as well. And you know, we are developing a master plan to how to go about and get the rest of the project CARM segment two and three implemented. Obviously, we need additional funding for that and we're working again together to, to address that funding need. And let me turn it back over to Darren, unless there is any questions for me. Sue, you, you look I, like you're ready to yeah. ask a question. I, I had a couple questions. Um, so um, you were talking about you know, ramp metering, encouraging carpooling, but you were saying something about exception with the car, we're not gonna have carpooling, right? It's just right. gonna be metered period, yeah. right? So, so that goes so, away. So our policy for ramp metering involves and includes also promoting carpooling. So in many areas where we are able to, there is room to widen the ramp, there is funding available. We allow for constructing 
a bypass lane for carpools and transit. Okay. In cases where we don't have that ability, then we, we, we need to, you know, justify, uh, you know, a, a deviation from that policy. Okay. Um, and then um, the $100 million will cover segment one. Will it also con cover design elements for segment two and three, or is it just the, design elements and construction of segment one? The $100 million will put in the baseline metering equipment and traffic operation that we need throughout the entire corridor. Oh. Segment one of CARM comes in, adds to that, and integrates the software, the better software that comes in, in that segment only. Okay. And then we will, we will follow through with okay, the. Okay, so it's the really the the CARM piece that needs additional funding, for segment two and three. Yes. Yeah. There. Go yes, <coughs> Stephanie could probably. Yeah, answer? I was just going to clarify because it is kind of confusing with different phases. So CARM, has the three segments, the the color coded map. Um, the segment one is northbound, north of 20, northbound, south of 24. Segment two is southbound, south of 24. I don't know if that map can be pulled up, but north of 24 is what we call segment three, and that's right. actually the most challenging. Um, so the segment one of CARM is what we have funding for, CCTA does, and that's what Darren spoke about. Um, what Sean is speaking about is their entire shop project that, in, that covers the entire corridor in both direction. Okay. And segment one of CARM is that little segment, not little, the segment between yeah. Acosta Olympic will get the, the CARM okay. treatment, yeah. so, so, so to speak. So the shop project is building the foundation yeah. for us, and then there's additive work that happens in order to bring that project up to a CARM level. Okay, great. Thank you. Other questions? Um, well, and so just to be clear, if the shop project is all the way up and down the corridor, when we have funding for CARM, are we going to have to remove anything, or is it just supports exactly what's already there? It's going to integrate. It's the latter. It, it, the analogy I can give is we're building the house with the shop project, with the Caltrans shop project, and then we are furnishing it with with CARM and the additional funding that comes. Okay, so we're not starting one thing and no. saying, okay, there, there is a no few throwaway. years down the road, we're gonna have yeah. to pull it out uh, uh, so we can have CARM okay, everywhere. Just, just to be clear, um, there will be some locations where that is the case, where we'll be able to repurpose the equipment and the improvements that are being done by the shop project, but there will likely be other locations that would require additional capacity to be installed at the, on the ramps in order to um, better accommodate CARM. Um, at those locations, we would have to evaluate whether we would be able to repurpose the existing equipment or whether we'd need to remove it and replace it with equipment in different locations um, once the improvements are done at those ramps. And so why wasn't that evaluated um, at the time of the design of the shop project? Because it seems inefficient to have us have the Caltrans project move forward if in fact it's not going to be shovel ready or plug-in ready, whatever it is, when CARM is ready to go at that place where we're going to be ripping out non-obsolete equipment. Let me, um, let me take a first crack and then I'll let Sean add to okay. it. Um, as you can imagine, um, there's been a, a need for a lot of coordination between the two projects. They've been you know, working in parallel and as, as much as we possibly can, we've been integrating. Um, but as you can also imagine, as a project gets developed, both the shop project and the CARM project, we learn more as we go along. And so as we've been working through the process, once we get information, a, a certain level of information on one project, we share it with the other project team and we try to make adjustments as possible. Um, Sean mentioned in his presentation, for example, they are installing that mid-queue detector that I talked about um, because Early in the process, we identified that with Caltrans and said, look, if you're going to be out there doing these ramp meters at these other locations, can you please install this additional one so that it's ready for us when we want to come in and do CARM in the future? Um, as they have got closer to the 65% mark, it, it has a, they've now got plans at enough detail that we can take a much closer look at what they're doing at some of those locations. And that's actually what sort of will be discussed in the next few slides. But, okay. you know, we've now identified where there are some places where we would need to do some additional improvements for CARM. But again, we are still working very closely with Caltrans to determine if there's a good strategy for moving forward to either implement CARM um, on the whole corridor with 
the work that's being done as part of shop, um, what additional um, investment would be necessary in order to bring it up to at least a minimum standard to run, uh, run CARM, um, those types of issues. And I mean, we were on meetings this afternoon yeah. with the same okay. folks that are here Great. having those conversations. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I can also add that with any project that has, you know, phases, there is some level of, you know, maybe what you call throwaway. But overall, in order for us to be in position to do better from where we are, we need to make this investment. And as I said, this is a very unique investment where we were able to come in with this $100 million. Uh, nowhere else we've been able to do that. So we want to be able to make this investment and make it easier to implement CARM later on. It's going to require much less effort and funding later on. Well, and that's important to me. I mean, $100 million is a lot, a lot of money, a huge investment in our corridor, absolutely a benefit regardless of CARM, but at the end of the day, it's still taxpayer dollars, whether it's the counties or whether it's the state. And my goal really is to ensure that you're not, in, in your, your plan, it's not something that we're going to be 10 years from now ripping it out when it has 30 years left in life no. to try to bring no, it up to CARM's level. I can assure level. you, if by chance, by whatever reason, we can't implement CARM, the, the equipment that we put in can be made to work. Okay. Maybe not to the level that we want, maybe it's slightly less, but it can work. Okay, thank you. And I, any other questions? Okay, please carry on. Back to you. Do you need me to shift over? Oh, I can take a shift. Okay. Okay, let's see. Where was I going to be? Okay, um, so I, I think you can see the theme uh, as part of the presentation is there's definitely been a lot of... Microphone. Oh, I've got to mark again. <laughs> I need the Zoom screen in front of me so I can hit the mute button. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, there's definitely been, there's a lot of overlap between the projects, there's definitely been a lot of collaboration that's happened throughout the process and, and Sean uh, talked about how the projects are being structured in order to um, maximise that, that overlap. Um, so just to, to reiterate that, so the shop phase one project, um, as Sean talked about, um, and the CARM segment one shop phase two project, CARM segment one and shop phase two are the same thing, or overlapping things. Um, are on different schedules. So the shop phase one project, um, which is being basically led by Caltrans with input from CCTA, um, is expected to be up and running by the end of 2026. Um, as Sean said, the construction will be finished, I mean, sorry, the, the, the design will be finished in the summer. Um, they'll be going out to bid and uh, we'll be starting the construction process um, later this year. Um, it goes for about two years of construction and then they'll be ultimately ready to operate. Um, we are probably a year behind um, on the shop phase two CARM segment one project, um, largely because of the funding, the STIP funding availability. Um, we could certainly accelerate the project if the funding was available and make them align more closely, but the limitations on the availability of the STIP funds that are being used to pay for the CARM segment one improvements that are additive to that $100 million that Sean talked about, um, that doesn't become available to us until 2027. So. Um, we have to wait uh, to start our construction. Uh, we expect to be done towards the end of 2027, early 2028, when we'll be up and, re and, up and running. And that's when, as Sean pointed out, we'll be taking a much closer look at other ways to leverage the CARM that's been deployed and to apply it to the other portions of the corridor. So, um, like every project, um, we encounter constraints as we go along. Um, we learn things are more expensive than we thought they were or that they're more difficult to implement than they thought we thought they were going to be. Um, so we've definitely encountered that on both projects, but especially on the shop project. Um, there are a lot of physical constraints within the corridor on the existing ramps. Um, there are some old design standards that we would never use anymore in terms of really tight hook ramps, really short ramps. Um, that don't give us the ability for a lot of storage um, with either type of ramp metering system. Uh, I think it's fair to say that both um, teams have, have strived to do the best that they can with the resources we have available to deliver projects that can work. Um, but we have, had to, uh, we have seen compromises on um, especially the shop project in terms of the available storage that we have on some of those ramps, and that has, um, has uh, raised concerns that we've been exploring with uh, both project teams. 
So the issue um, came up at one of the ESC meetings, the Executive Steering Committee meetings that um, also are important in driving the, the um, Innovate 680 process. They're the uh, equivalent committee to yours on the uh, agency side. So that is the directors of Caltrans, MTC, and CCTA. Um, they participate in the Executive Steering Committee and at the meeting back in, when was it, February, January? Was it that long ago? Wow. Um, there was a discussion about this very issue um, that re really pre preempted a lot of the elevated coordination on um, would it be suitable to use CARM to run the shop ramp metering project. And so we've been working very closely with our local partners, with Caltrans, to try and determine if there are opportunities to do that. Um, we've stepped up that cooperative process um, and de developed a, a deployment plan um, to look at that possibility, and uh, that will be getting rolled out to the TAC at their upcoming meeting in a couple of weeks. Um, and I expect that they will then report back to this group um, on the findings of that process. Um, and again, we are working very, very closely with Caltrans and uh, CCTA and Caltrans um, in pursuing available funding opportunities. Um, the congestion re relief program grant that I mentioned before, um, that one's active right now. I think they're due next week or the week after next. So we're in the throes of wrapping up that um, grant application. We, have a, we feel like we have a very strong um, grant application. Um, it definitely is consistent with the goals of that program. And so we're very hopeful that we'll be able to secure additional funding um, for the current project through the CRP. And then uh, CCTA has now started the process of developing a new mega grant um, to accommodate additional um, work for CARM um, to take on some of those other segments, segment two and segment three. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I am going to turn it back over to Chair Anderson to accommodate the roundtable discussion session, but I would certainly invite any additional questions on the technical stuff that we presented um, in anticipation of that. Okay, let's start with questions, and then we do have some roundtable discussions. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Okay, any questions on what's been presented so far? Please go ahead. So I see it says questions, comments, or concerns. So in, in the top Yes, we could start, we can start right <laughs> you in. You can start let's, the roundtable. Let's, let's start that's the roundtable. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. We're here to no, answer no, no, questions. No, I was just sort of doing first anything he said so far. Okay. But it all ties in. So why yeah. don't you, okay. you go ahead and lead with that, Carl, and that we've got, do you have any questions, comments, concerns regarding the implementation of ramp metering on the um, CC, the Contra Costa I-680 corridor? And again, I think every jurisdiction has been hesitant, and we've been trying to allay concerns. But let's start with you, Carlin. What are your concerns? <laughs> sure. So just speaking on behalf of the city of Concord, so I appreciated um, Council Member or Vice Mayor Novak um, raising, um, you know, the question about the coordination with the local jurisdictions. And so, again, I think whenever I hear about this, I'm open to innovation, but I think the concern is always how is this going to impact our you know, residential streets and any kind of backups. And so that's the only thing I just want to reiterate is um, the, the need to continually uh, stay in close communication with our local transportation folks to make sure that there's smooth implementation, everybody knows what's going to happen, and we can minimize the, the impacts on the, on the residential streets. So that's all I wanted to say on that. Okay. Go ahead, Karen. I got this on here on the same topic there. So when we did the express lanes and we opened them and suddenly they were going to be all day and not just in the morning and the evening, that was a big surprise to people. And so what I hear when she's saying that is how important it is to make sure there's, if you make a last minute change that you don't implement it the next day, but you have time again to acclimate the people that this is why and what we're changing. So thank you. Sue. I didn't really have a question, but I, I guess my comment really is, you know, I, I've sat through quite a few of these presentations at this point, and honestly, really, if it works well, we should have a whole lot less concern about backed up on our, our streets, because if it works well, there should be better flow. Uh, you know, the concern always was if it really backs up and starts backing up our arterials, but the concept really ought to work. And most of the time actually improve the situation than hurt the situation. So, uh, you know, I'm glad it's been done before and we're not the first ones doing this, so I'm really glad to hear that. 
And uh, you know, my other comment that I just wanted to make is it's great to hear and see how well you guys are coordinating on this because um, you know, it's always a big question. Caltrans is you know, massive in size. And so it's great to see such cooperation and coordination with you guys. So I, I really appreciate that and hope that continues. Thanks. Well, and my comment kind of leads into our neck, our second question too. It's we, we've got shop, we've got CARM. Shop is going to be going in. Essentially, it sounds like to just about all of all of the ramps along the corridor. CARM is going to be phased into different ramps. Um, not to judge CARM and shop, but CARM seems a little smarter than shop with regard to being able to identify who, who, what, and where is coming in. How are we really going to address some of the concerns of the cities um, where it sounds like CARM probably is less likely, and I'm just speculating, to back up on major arterial roads because it's more intuitive, it has different AI that's going to allow things to move smoother, whereas I don't know if shop following more traditional while improving, utilizing technology, may cause those problems. One of my concerns is when we have cities that are getting the shop but not getting the CARM, they're going to have the backup, they're going to be upset, and we're going to have challenges in really um, rolling this out in a, in a positive way. So that's just a common concern I have. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think some of the shop stuff expanding the meters for more storage should help with that quite a bit. I, I hope I would, so. I would, I would think that if some I of may that. respond to that, yeah. that, that's been the challenge with metering. How yeah. do you address when the problem extends onto the local streets? And it can happen on a recurrent basis, or it can happen when we have incidents on the freeway. So the metering actually gives us the opportunity to better manage that. You know, we are able to, um, you know, influence the metering rates elsewhere downstream to be able to get traffic off of the local streets faster. Uh, and, you know, we've always had strategies such as flushing the traffic that queues at the ramps where we have problem areas or turning the ramp meter off in a way to turn it on green and allow everybody to come in. And again, it takes working with the local jurisdiction to coordinate the signals with the ramp meter and, you know, making them work together. So that, that has been going on. You know, we have staff in the field in, at, with our implementations that daily run through these different ramps and make those observations, make those adjustments. With CARM, we are going to be able to uh, manage that more remotely, more real time, and more automatically in a way. And so, and so SHOP has that capability to do that remote. Let me tell you, shop isn't all that bad. What we call okay. the adaptive no, no, ramp meter. No, is, and it's just, we're, we're serving sort of being the sold. difference between, you know, maybe a Mercedes and a Lexus. I, I, I don't know. No, so. no, and I, I appreciate that. I, again, because we've been so focused on how are we going to manage this corridor um, in a, you know, electronically, and obviously none of us want um, to lose that ability yeah. since that's really our goal. So if, if shop has some of those great bells and whistles that we're, we're hearing about that CARM has, I think, yeah. and they can be managed remotely, like you said, when there's an incident, that's our number one goal is to keep things moving. So thank I, you. I, I, would, I would point out um, your executive director is not here tonight, but um, he's heard these concerns expressed over the years, and it was really um, his vision that, that identified CARM as a concept that may actually help to mitigate some of the concerns that you've raised um, in implementing ramp metering in the corridor. Because um, as Sean said on one of our calls earlier today, um, ramp metering is definitely better than not doing ramp metering. Um, but CARM elevates it to an entirely new level. It's supercharging those cars and, and allowing the ramps to work far more effectively to mitigate the primary concern that local agencies have the spillback onto the arterial onto the arterial streets, and and that was from the ground up a core component of developing this particular right. approach to CARM, which is why we think it's going to have strong applicability here in Contra Costa County. Okay, thank you, and Robert, you looked like you were ready yeah, to go. Thank you. you know, the, the, I don't know if it's a concern because we live in a world where you know three years ago in the town of Danville we upgrade our software system and then 
three years later, it seems to be antiquated. Then we go home and now we have streaming and we need more you know, con connectivity and you know, some parts of my house, which is newer, are, are antiquated. So you look at this and you think, well, I know we have the biggest and the baddest you know, technology today, but we've heard that in the past and all of a sudden, literally in a very short period of time, in a half a decade, it's all antiquated systems. So w what are we doing to sort of anticipate what the next level or the next generation of technology will be and how are we working this in the system? Because at some point, and it may be a very short period of time down the road, what we have in the ground, you know, I, I don't know what's better than fiber optics, but you know there will be something. How are we going to change all that? I think Candace sort of touched base on this. That's a lot of money if you put it in the ground and then all of a sudden have to remove it. And we see this in, you know, with, you know, a lot of projects along the way here. What's, what's your thoughts on this? Well, or Sean, Darren. Sure. <laughs> Again, that's an excellent observation. You know, we have connected autonomous vehicles coming our way. Can you talk to the, a little closer yes. to the microphone? We, Thank we you. have connected autonomous vehicles coming our way. That's going to change entirely, you know, our approach. We, we do want to work with the manufacturing industry, build in enough of these systems that allow us to better communicate with the vehicles so, you know, we can lessen the investment on the infrastructure on the highway side. Or if we make any investments, it's investment that complements what's already in the vehicle, for example. So with, with that kind of technology coming our way fast, uh, we have to keep up with, with the industry, with the manufacturers. We do have a division of research and innovation in Caltrans that does that work, tries to keep up uh, with the technology and what's going on throughout the country. So the reality is we will have upgrades along the way to accommodate whatever yeah. type of vehicles we have on the road. At, at some point, the driver is going to be taken out of the vehicle. And that, that will make our job a lot easier. <laughs> It'll create a different job. But uh, um, just to add to that, I mean, you know, first and foremost, I mean, this is, this is our business. This is what Sean and I do. So, um, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to keep up with the industry. Um, you're absolutely right. It's an it's a ever-evolving situation. But, you know, we, we try to keep on top of what the emerging technologies are, look for places where others have had experience with technologies that have worked for them that would have applicability to what we do. And so we try to bring those you know, together. Um, I think, again, to, to Tim's credit, Innovate 680 was developed as a program to do exactly that, was to, was to sort of allow some of these formative technologies to be brought to, to Contra Costa County and to see what might work. Um, we evolve them as we go, and we're always sort of learning as we go through these processes, and as we identify new uh, approaches that may be suitable, we adapt them if we can into the projects. Um, I will say specific to CARM, um, they're always, uh, uh, the, the, if you ever have the opportunity to go down to Melbourne, and um, we can set you up to, with the Victorians. I mean, Stephanie had the opportunity last year um, to, to meet with them. They are already a generation ahead of us um, in their next um, generation of CARM deployments. Um, they're looking at, uh, they use the turtles now to measure lane changing on the main line, which is the main factor that contributes to breakdown, um, the, the friction that's caused by vehicles changing lanes as they go. Um, so they're already adapting their algorithms to accommodate and read that information and to dial that into the process. They're using variable speed limits as another metering tool on the main line itself. Um, so they're already adding further innovations to streams that in the future will be able to be utilized here in Contra Costa County um, once we get the systems out there and installed. Um, and they're now, um, the, the developers of streams are now also looking at connected vehicle technologies to help inform those algorithms rather than having to install detectors out into the field to actually use the vehicles themselves as probes to inform the systems and to, as Sean said, communicate then to the autonomous vehicles that are driving themselves and telling them specifically what lane I want you to be in, where and how fast and all that sort of stuff. That's sort of the emerging paradigm of, of this industry. So we try to keep up. Um, but, you know, sometimes th th there's a bit of a chase going on as well. So, so uh, if construction starts in, let's say, 2027 and we're, we're up and running in 2028, newest and best technology goes into the ground, what, in your opinion, you think would be the shelf life before we have to do any upgrades? 
Well, um, I, I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily characterized that way. Um, I think it gives you. It will give you a foundational system that will allow you to more readily build upon it okay. to incorporate some of these new developments. So what we might. So the, the the traffic management system gives you that basis. We may change some of the inputs, so we may use different detection devices, or you know, uh, uh, like for example. Um, LiDAR is now emerging as a, a, a new, new type of vehicle detection technology that may be suitable for these applications. So we may have some of those inputs changing, yeah. but I think the underlying principles that are driving that control system will still have applicability and will give you that foundation that will allow us to more readily include some of those elements. Um, the, the other thing I'll add is Stephanie mentioned the CATS project, the Coordinated Adaptive Traffic Signals Program. Um, we, we also, uh, also the part-time transit lane, we're looking at the integration of elements of those projects into CARM and how can the systems work together in order to accomplish the same goal. So for example, with part-time transit lanes, can we use CARM and the ramp meters to actually allow the buses to then have priority past those ramps? Well, of course, the signals will be there so we can use them to stop them down. So we're working on that integration. And in fact, uh, the, the streams developers will be here next week having a series of meetings with the technical teams on all of those projects to look at some of those integration possibilities and to build some of those capabilities into the platform. So I think it's an evolving thing, and but this will give you a foundation that you can build upon. Okay, thank you. And light hours, what was that, Sean? Lidar. Lidar. <laughs> no, they've got the laser. Lidar. It's like a radar. Lidar. Lidar is um, uh, uh, is laser linear. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you in the it's, back. It's, a, it's, it's basically a different type. It's, it's similar to radar, but it's a different type of yeah. uh, technology that light allows... Light detection and ranging. There you go. Light detection and ranging. Yeah. There we go. Um, thank you. It thank allows you. for more accurate um, more accurate detection than, than radar. Uh, radar is a, a more rudimentary um, approach and doesn't give the same level of accuracy. There's a lot more issues with occlusion and things like that. But LIDAR is giving us now the possibility to develop like digital twins of the of, of uh, performance on the network. Okay. And if we can get to that level of accuracy where we can actually sort of model how the, the, the network's performing in real time, that can then inform these types of control systems and make them more effective. Thank you. OK. Go ahead, Boella, please. Thank you. Um, I'm actually looking further on, and we're in Walnut Creek. Uh, we have a re route of regional importance. What is the right significance? Term? Right? Significance. Regional significance. Yes. yes. There you go. I, important. But it is important. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and and is ultimately the plan to include to use some of the technology out so that you know where the big feeder lines are and how to measure those into the system. Yeah, so the CATS program is looking to do some of that, um, is to upgrade the detection capabilities on the, on the arterial network, and that might be using other types of detection technologies or other types of data technologies, the vehicles themselves, again, for example, and to inform the traffic signal progression to the freeways, but we can also use that information to inform the freeway ramps and the freeways of the traffic that's coming in their direction so that, in turn, they can send back information to the traffic signals that says, okay, slow them down a little bit because we're not quite ready for them, or speed them up a little bit because we want them here right now because now's the opportunity to get them on. So yeah, we're definitely looking at the possibilities for those types of integrations. There's, of course, other aspects as well, emergency vehicle priority, transit vehicle priority. They also get integrated into these types of systems as well. So we're looking at how we can package all of this together and to deliver, again, better product, better, a better travel experience for the residents of Contra Costa. Okay, any other, we're gonna move on to our second roundtable discussion, and we've kind of touched on it a bit. It says, if CARM operations are the desired ramp metering strategy for the I-680 corridor, how can we work toward consistent deployment for the entire corridor just beyond segment one? Um, obviously funding. <laughs> I think that's it. It's, I think it's the, the money, I, and I think my big concern, which, which I appreciate, Sean, Elaine, my concerns, I just wanted to make sure that what you're doing is compatible. If our goal, which from my perspective, is to get CARM um, ultimately out there, unless there's something newer and better, or CARM 2 or CARM 3, whatever it is, I just don't want us um, being w wasting resources and time and effort. So it sounds like you are coordinating that, working on that. Anyone else have comments on that? 
Okay, so we're looking for money, and I know there's always going to be another sales tax measure down the road or something, or grants, um, especially with this innovation that's different than others. I'm hopeful that we can be active looking for that. Um, so our third um, roundtable discussion question is, the Innovate 680 TAC members have requested additional individual meetings with local jurisdiction technical staff, as well as presentations to city councils regarding the corridor ramp metering strategy. What additional outreach and education is needed for your agency and the public? And I think this goes to Karen's comment early how a lot of us were very frustrated when the um, express, lanes. <laughs> express lanes came in. We were promised they were going to be carpool hours, and then suddenly they were all day, and MTC said, too bad, that's your problem. This is what we need to do to be consistent with the rest of the world. So um, who else should we be reaching out to? We've got your councils. We've got your tax. Um, how else, Sue? Well, I, I just think it's a timing thing. I think if you go out and start telling people about CARM and CATS now, you'll have everybody freaked out about something that's not gonna happen for three or four years. So I understand working with the, the, you know, the technical staff earlier on, but as far as presentations to city councils and things like that about how CARM's gonna work or how CATS is gonna work, I would certainly move that a lot closer to when it's gonna happen than now. You know, I can, I can see people freaking out that their, you know, their arterial is gonna get even more backed up and, it, uh, it, it just would raise a whole lot of alarms earlier on. Yeah, so part of the TAC conversation, I think it's also the implementation of SHOP, because that's earlier yeah. on. I think that was, if I recall correctly, that was that was the essence of the comment. Like before oh, okay. the SHOP ramp metering comes on, they're going to see ramp meters being put up um, to be able to educate your council. Um, not specific, to, that question is not specific to CARM and CAS. Okay. Like to your okay. point, it may not happen for another two, three years, but the SHOP project is um, ready to start con construction next year. So um, that, that, that would be helpful at, at council to hear that. Um. Well, and I, I think for councils as well as cities, all are putting out their own uh, monthly or even weekly blast electronically. Um, county supervisors, Ken and I and our colleagues do that too. Again, it, it's getting information, it's getting the FAQs, having a link or a QR code, whatever it is, to take people right back to what is the project. In very simple layman's term, this is going to... Um, keep our freeways moving quicker. This is going to help you not get in a, you know, backup on your way to work, on your way home from work. And then to me, it's it's so important to be communicating um, throughout the process too, whether it be delays, whether it be changes. And there's no one from the city of San Ramon here who, for those of us who live in the Danville San Ramon area, they have been tearing up Crow Canyon Row. Oh, Hello, Chris. Crow Canyon Road. <laughs> it's been a nightmare. I mean, it ha you know, it's one of those things, and, and everyone just looks at each other and says, wait, how long is this going to be? And for those of us who are trying to get to the hospital to see their father last yesterday, it was suddenly like, I have to go all the way down and around and up El cost. So to me, it's just communicating. People can live with delays if they understand why they're there. So to me, it's it's not a one and done thing. It's an ongoing place where people can go to get updates, communication, and ensuring that all of us as ambassadors for CCTA have that information, have that link that we can keep pushing out, and have a very dynamic space where that information is coming. I would, and I, I would emphasize simplicity, just the simplest, <laughs> easiest message. Yep. And this is a very complicated project. But we have to excel this to our communities, and we have to sell it to the people that are most affected each and every morning. So if you could help us with just a, a simple message that we could bring out to our community, and I'm, and I'm hoping we're not you're going to use that yeah, contractor on Crow Canyon on no, this project well, I, here. <laughs> We've decided against that, correct? Yeah, no, no, it's, no, it's... No comment there. Sorry, Chris. Your 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 electeds hear from us all the time of the project that will never be completed and inconvenience all of the San Ramon Valley. But nevertheless, um, we won't use that. Okay. Any other? 
We, yeah. These are questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Karen, please Just go ahead. Just a quick quant comment because I was thinking how uh, fortunate we are that we have things like Diablo Magazine, et cetera, that often foresee these things in other countries. Like you said, Melrose, they come up and they say, will this be happening here someday? And it's not a threat and it's not we're doing this. It's like it's something out there like when I get the Science and Tech mag Magazine from the national labs. They're looking forward and you're thinking, yeah, someday I might be reading more about this. And way before you're talking about, oh, it's going to be in your neighborhood next week. No, and I think that I love the fact, Karen, that you're highlighting um, not just metering ramps are coming in, but yeah. the technology and that it's tested technology that's been used in Melbourne and that um, we, we're going to be state of the art. It's only being used here and down in Riverside or wherever it's being used. Um, those things, I think, are important in a very tech savvy community where so many of our residents do work in tech and they certainly are um, impacted by it. And it looks like you're Daniel. here to share something really important with us. <laughs> I just wanted, uh, so Danielle Stanislas, yes, um, Danielle. I am your stakeholder engagement <clears throat> manager and a part of the systems management team. And I just want to thank you guys for engaging in this roundtable discussion. The technical advisory committee, your, your staff, um, had a similar conversation back at the end of February. That's why we're here with you guys tonight. And so on on this notion of both the stakeholder engagement, the public engagement side, um, it is our intent. We wanted to cycle back to the TAC, Darren alluded to this, at the end of April with more details, more of the technical details on the ramp metering deployment plan. Then we wanted to have these one-on-one -on -one meetings at their request um, to dive into those technical details. And of course, we would do that before any sort of larger public outreach, public engagement. And as you know, the Innovate 680 program has a whole public engagement discipline to work with the simplified messaging, what's the consistent messaging, what's the right timing, how do we solicit the right input from the right people at the right time. So, so um, we do anticipate coming back to you all on this topic at your July meeting with an, with an update on everything. And at that point, the TAC will have met and we will have had more of these one-on-one -on -one conversations. Great, thank you, Danielle. It's so nice to see you in person. It yeah, was, it's so great to see you guys too. It, it's so <laughs> funny, I, I didn't put the two and two together. So we're gl glad to see you. Okay, did we have any public comment on this item? I was just making sure no other committee members and Terry and we didn't have any written comment. No public comment's been received. Okay, and anyone in the audience wishes to stand up, defend their city? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, and then online, no comments either, I'm guessing. Okay. No comment. So we're going to go on to another informational item. Stephanie is doing this one again, and this is going to be an update on our Innovate 680 Express Lane Completion Project. Um, this will be a quick update. You guys have heard a lot about the Express Lanes project, so I'm going to quiz you at the end. No, I'm just kidding. Really, the project goal is to close or reduce the Express Lane gap on the corridor between Avorna and just north, just south of the bridge. We have we have been studying four alternative, as you know, ranging from closing the gap, reducing the gap, and all four alternatives is in common on the northern segment, north of 242, where we convert the existing HOV to express. Um, all four alternatives, except for alternative five, um, proposes to add a lane for the new express lane. Alternative five is the special one where we would take the inside lane to convert to an express lane. So these are the four alternatives at the table that we're currently studying. The point of today's uh, conversation to bring it back to you guys is just to alert you all that we are gearing up for public circulation of the draft environmental document in early May. Um, we would have a 45-day period for comments and we uh, are proposing two public meetings, um, one in person and one virtual, where the public can come virtually or in person in this boardroom to provide comments about the alternative, answer any questions. So those are scheduled in early June as shown on the slide. Um, we are developing public outreach plans. So we are actually developing a couple of videos, one to explain what is SB 743 related to those alternatives that add capacity. Um, first, to, yeah, explain SB 743, why is, what is VMT? So that's more of a general video to explain that, and then the second video to further explain those alternatives that we're studying. 
And then the fourth bullet there about stakeholder coordination, really we would appreciate your help to spread the word when the document's on the street to engage, uh, to share it like you were saying, an email blast, social media, so that your constituents and public uh, or residents can comment on the alternatives which would be useful for us to select the alternative in the summertime. And that will be useful for us for funding opportunities later this year as well. So it just it's a quick item for you um, put on your radar that we're preparing for that public circulation of traffic. Well, and with proposed stopping. legislation that would preclude funding for new lanes, how, how are we handling that? So um, is that alternative five? <laughs> <laughs> so um, we wouldn't be able to release the draft environmental document, actually, if we don't have a VMT mitigation proposal. OK. And which we do have. We got the approval from Caltrans director at headquarters last year, okay. so that was required for us to even get to this point okay, to demonstrate just, that we can mitigate. Okay, just wanted to make sure because that does come up in other agencies as well. Yeah. Okay, go and, ahead, Sue. And there seems to be more movement in Sacramento to really not allow expansion of highways regardless of VMT mitigation. Right, I think it's Having to spent there th this morning on the yeah. SB 1031, which we'll be discussing Friday at MTC, yeah, so far we've been engaging with Caltrans on the funding side. They've done yeah. a lot of intake forms for this next round of SB1 funding, supposedly out in the fall. Um, in the questions themselves, they do ask about that and how we mitigate. Um, we haven't gotten the formal word that it's not allowed to, uh, uh, to apply. Um, so far the, the directions on those forms, for example, are Thing, you know, demonstrate how you're going to offset the VMT um, right. as a package. I, I'm just concerned if, you know, if we had a first round and we need a second round or something that the trend has seems Yeah, to be I think in, in the future direction. it's heading that direction, yeah. but, you know, Caltrans staff is here, no, not the right department, but um, it, it may become, it may come down to that in the future cycles, but the call for, sorry, the guidance for this next round isn't out yet. They're still gathering inputs. Okay. And we've been part of that exercise, like giving comments to the guidance and criteria and whatnot. So great, thank you. Other other questions, comments? Karen, your light's on, but that may not oh, mean you I... have a question. Okay. We we're just whipping right through. Okay, Stephanie, do you have anything else for us on that? No, nothing to add. Okay, and do we have any question any comments from people here, written comment, people online? I've received no public comments. Okay, so it looks like Jack is queued up. He's sitting in the seat, he's ready to go, and he's gonna be talking to us about automated driving systems, the ADS project update, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson. Good evening, and uh, committee mem members. Um, so I'm gonna give you an update on the automated driving system uh, grant that we were awarded by the Federal Transit Administration in January of 2020. And one of the one of the goals, you know, our goals are to uh, reduce congestion, um, improve safety. We think that um, autonomous vehicles will not hit each other and hit uh, vulnerable road users, uh, such as bicyclists, bicyclists, and pedestrians. Um, also, we're trying to help the economy here in Contra Costa and uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So our ADS pro, uh, application it actually includes three projects that I'm going to discuss tonight. Project one is in Rossmore in Walnut Creek, um, active adult community. Project two is at the county hospital, um, trying to provide more transportation options for people that maybe cannot afford um, to get to their appointments. And project three, which we kind of talked about a little bit tonight, is we're trying to uh, improve uh, throughput on I-680 and also in San Ramon um, protect vulnerable road users, um, which I'll discuss later. Okay, so first is our Rossmore project. Um, so this, this project, again, it's an active adult community. The average age is 77. Um, we're getting real close to deployment, it's actually target is for May of next next month. Um, and so we're just working through some of the final issues. Our vendor is Beep. Um, they're gonna be operating 
Ollie 2 um, shared autonomous vehicles. And one of the issues here is that um, when you have a grant from the, the federal government, you have to do Buy America, and there's no autonomous vehicles made in America. So what, you, what we've done is we've contracted with Beep, who then um, can get different vehicles. Again, so this is Rossmore, and then the, um, the route that we're going to be using is from the community center to the fitness center. And then one of the issues here, too, is they have a new, so Ollie, and then overall on this project, from when we applied, every vendor except Verizon has either not, they're not in the business anymore, or um, they went out of business. And even Verizon, who was on the initial application, they shut down their original um, smart cities deployment. So it's, that's been one of the big challenges with this project is, is the, um, so what we do is we call agile project management and it's really applicable because you have to be agile on this. Um, the next project is the county hospital project and this one where our vendor or our, our OEM is May Mobility. May Mobility is Basically, Toyota, uh, they're the president of the company, May Mobility, used to head the research department at Toyota. And so we're using Toyota Siennas, um, which I'll talk about um, in, in a couple slides. One of the, so when we first applied for this, this project, it was pre-pandemic, and so people were not making it to their appointments. But during the pandemic, almost all appointments now are, are, not almost all, but a lot are virtual. So our use cases have changed. So we've worked with the county hospital, and mainly, uh, so they have caseworkers at the county hospital, and they came up with the idea, with, I mean, from experience with when they're working with patients, there's some people that qualify for free rides, like a free Uber ride from the hospital, or um, a free taxi cab ride. But there's certain people that fall through the cracks, they don't qualify yet, they can't afford these um, rides. And it, it's a significant amount of rides, like a thousand um, a month. And so what we're gonna do, and we're working with County Connection on this. County Connection is actually providing the drivers, and then we'll provide the car, which you can see in the uh, picture. It's got the beautiful Presto wrap, which is, is it's impressive. The cars, in, in my opinion, they're, they're nice vehicles. So and so we're going to hopefully be running the um, the service for the case for the the people that can't get a ride to so after their appointment they might have to go to say um, Walmart or to get um, a prescription filled so that that is that um, that use case and then we're also going to probably run from six to ten in the evening when County Connection does not run so that well right now that that project's we have seven vehicles. They're located um, just north of Highway 4. I, I um, committee member Obringer might, is it the Concord Industrial Park? I'm not sure, north of, it's just north of the County Connection um, area towards, towards the river. And a very nice facility um, is right close to County Connection and Martinez where we'll be running so that we're in good shape there once we get this, um, all the routes and the timing uh, Situated so that we, we're looking at late spring or early summer 2020 20, 20, for our launch. This is the the Toyota Sienna platform. One of the highlights of this vehicle is that it comes off the production line, ready for autonomous vehicle. You just have to plug in like a, um, a robotics package, but all the um, the drive by wire and the equipment is set to go and what that does is it really improves the feel of the ride and makes it um, a lot smoother and then these will that these uh, vans are will well not all of them but um, I, actually I, don't, I think it was like four are wheelchair um, accessible that they are not ADA compliant because not all wheelchairs will fit into the vehicle but they are um, wheelchair accessible and that is um, one of the issues um, 
with, with these vehicles. There's just not many autonomous vehicles that are ADA compliant. And then this is our third project, which is the I-680 corridor. Um, in this project, we're using um, cooperative congestion management. And what we're trying to do here is reduce the shock waves or phantom um, traffic jams. So when you're driving on the freeway, all of a sudden for no reason at all, you have to slow down to almost a complete stop. And so we have adaptive cruise control, and what will happen is the signal will be sent to the vehicle, which actually reduces the speed or sets the speed at, at, the, optimum, um, at the optimum amount so that you get more through traffic and you don't have these phantom um, traffic jams. So that's kind of, and it would tie into like other systems that you have in place. And then this is what we're going to do. We're actually, we just have an agreement with San Ramon, and we're going to be installing uh, cameras. And then this is kind of a, um, so this is Nissan as our partner here. And so we did this testing at Gomentum Station, and then they shut down the whole camera unit. So we've been scrambling to try to get new cameras, and then, um, and then the LIDAR, which I had written down, lag detection and and ranging. <laughs> so, um, That'll be our homework, everyone. Yeah. We're going to, there'll be a quiz. That <laughs> and, and one of the highlights on LIDAR is that it, you don't get the license plate or faces, so it's anonymous, which is good for um, security. Okay, now, um, I, I actually am doing this presentation tomorrow for TransPAC, and I gave it to the TAC. <laughs> Lucky okay. Ken and Sue, yay! Wawella, you've got Ken and I are going out for coffee. If I'm and right. Wawella, take Wawella too. <laughs> you can make it really short tomorrow at Transpac. Okay. <laughs> well, then tomorrow for yeah. So so Pete. At the TAC, <laughs> it'll be in the morning. I'm a little bit more, I'm better in the morning. But, um, yeah, you guys, I think. So at the TAC, at the Transpat TAC, they go like, why don't you use Waymo or someone like that? Well, one of the requirements of this project is data. And a lot of these OEMs do not want to share data. It's very difficult. So I'm going to play this. Um, This is a demonstration of how all the data flows. So what happens is, so we're getting data from traffic signals, we're getting uh, data from the vehicles, we're getting um, data from uh, roadside units, and all three of the projects. And then it comes in to a company that we're using is Telegra, and they're based in Croatia. So they collect all this data, and then Another question that had come up, like, what do you do with this data? Well, well one of the things that you, we have to collect the data as a, as a grant requirement. But at, at this, not, my next slide, I'll show you how we actually can use the data. Um, again, let's, let's see, is this This over? looks like your con ops chart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a... a, a <laughs> I'll just, I'll just go to the next slide. <laughs> Good idea. Okay, so then on this, on this slide, so then we collect all this mass amount of data. And, and maybe you could see that the, the image on top is a, like a, a LIDAR map, a point data map, which has all this data. But then there's a company named Hex out of France. They take this massive amounts of data and they can like pick out an instant using statistics. And so then you can see when like a gentleman or a, a pedestrian walks out. So, so that's what, so that's, and then, and then a city engineer or, um, you know, the county or the, or the Caltrans, we can pick out these locations where maybe there's um, some improvements that need to be made. Um, in the intersection or the roadway. 
So again, this company takes all that massive amounts of data and makes it to where it's usable. Okay, now this one is not actually the ADS project, but it is um, autonomous vehicles. This is in Bishop Ranch, and this project, we, we launched these shuttles in uh, almost a year ago. And, and in fact, today I took the Association of German Transport Companies. Um, they're on a U.S. autonomous vehicle tour. So we took them out and they, they rode on the Presto. Um, this is a Navia shuttle that they're made in France. And then this is the route. Anyone can go and ride these shuttles. Um, they're open 7.30 to 5.30, five days a week. Um, and today I was really impressed because again, this was another use case that the pandemic kind of hurt a little bit because a lot of people were working from home. But today at, at Bishop Ranch, there was, I mean, the parking lot was packed. So hopefully this use case will come back. And this is because we can't really run BART down I-680, so you take a bus rapid transit from, say, Walnut Creek BART or Contra Costa Center, you go to the transit center in Bishop Ranch, and then you take these shuttles to your office. So th this one has a little bit of legs, it's coming back. And that is my um, report, I'm any, happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Okay, it looks like you have a question. Go ahead, I Carlin. I do, I do. So I just wanted to clarify so um, a few things. So with the, um, the Martinez um, route, I heard you say something about County Connection in Concord and then also Martinez, so I was a little bit confused. So is there something in North Concord or, or no? No, so Concord is just where they have their office. Okay, um, okay. Because yes, they're, they're, I do know that. Yeah, I, yeah. and there was, okay. there's a lot of great office space, and I mean, it's beautiful. Um, we had a meeting there. It's just north of um, the, the County Connection yard. Mm -hmm. And so that that way they're close to County Connection and Martinez. Now this project, if it does mm -hmm. take off and, and it's something that we want to continue with, mm -hmm. um, we do plan on expanding to other regions that County Connection serves. Okay. But I mean, the funding would be a, a, a consideration there. And then my other question was, so this is, um, I'm just wondering because I know under Medi-Cal, um, there is funding that is provided to help transport people, so Medi-Cal um, beneficiaries. So is there any way, have there been any conversations? Is that who's being transported? Do you have any sense, you know, so that, speaking of funding, so that potentially you could tap into that source of funding to help get patients to their appointments? And that's a great suggestion. And um, working with County Connection, because they are very familiar with these different funding plans, and. And also the, um, the rules in transit are very um, extensive. So we work with County Connection and the County Hospital, and I'll, I'll put that down as a possible funding source to continue the project. I mean, once we have the grant funding runs out, we'll, we'll need to look if they want to continue doing that, um, and that's a great suggestion, and, and we'll look into that funding opportunity. Thank you. Just a question on the Sienna vehicles. Sorry that I don't know, or maybe I'm lucky I don't know, but it, you know, you say wheelchair accessible, but does someone have to get that wheelchair up the ramp, or is there some kind of mechanical? I mean, if the person needs help getting it there, isn't that kind of a, a problem right. here for this service? So there's what's called an AVO, an autonomous vehicle operator, which is kind of I don't know, but it, it helps. An oxymoron so, is what it really is. <laughs> if it's so, an autonomous vehicle and you have an operator, it's, so, it's not autonomous. So we, we, want, we did want in our initial application to have automatic wheelchair, wheelchair docking, and we met with um, May Mobility, mm -hmm. and we said, hey, we would like to do the um, automated wheelchair, wheelchair docking. However, they are... Um, they're, they're, I don't know what, how you would describe it, but they're engineering. They go, we'll put that on the list, but they have roadmaps, and they will not deviate from that. They have a, a, a goal, and they stay on that goal. And they'll say, well, we'll add that on. However, um, it's not going to be a part of this project, I don't think. So that's but, probably but, spelled but, liability. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, but it is, it is a goal. Thank you. Okay. Other questions that we have? 
Save, save, yeah, save them all for tomorrow. <laughs> Those of you on TransCAC, and <laughs> let so, us know how it goes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, hopefully, I, you know, I'll be a little bit more happy. Okay, thank you so much, Jack. And real quick, Tarian, no written comments ahead of time, no one on Zoom, no one here in the room wishing to comment? No public comments been received. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you so much. And we've got another informational item um, from Danielle. So thank you, Danielle. And she is going to be giving us the opportunity for feedback that, because that, she hasn't right, heard enough from us tonight. Because you guys haven't given enough already. No, it's yeah. been great. Um, so this is just the standing open call for additional items to be agendized for your next meeting, which will be in July. Um, as you heard earlier, we're already planning to come back to you with some additional information on the ramp metering strategy coordination. We also hope to wrap in some of the <laughs> arterial component that Darren mentioned, the coordinated adaptive traffic signals piece, so you can get more of a sense of what that integration is looking like from a demonstration perspective. But this is your opportunity. If there are other projects, any of the innovate ones that Stephanie mentioned that you specifically would like to hear more on, now is the time. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands <laughs> up. Um, I, they'll let you know. <laughs> Before that the sounds next good. Meeting. We will continue. Yeah. Oh, oh, Carly, yes, I'm sorry. I, I just have one Thank suggestion. You. It's not a yeah. presentation item, and I could have totally missed this, but is it possible to get the presentation you know, in advance? Because I was trying to see the screen here, and I was trying to see the screen there, and it was, it was just hard. So is it possible to have it sent to us, like all the PowerPoint presentations? Yeah, it was sent out, but later than we normally would have, would have. So maybe you missed it, but we'll okay. make sure her name, your name, is on the list. But yeah, we do okay. normally send it out at least, you know, three, four days before. And I didn't we'll even see it like on the website. Like I was searching through the website, it okay. wasn't so in we'll, the packet. So we'll check on it. So yeah, it would just be helpful because. Okay. If yeah, I missed it, I went to the website and I didn't yeah. find it. And that just makes it easier for me to be able to engage on my screen. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. We'll make sure that we get you the materials in advance and we'll make sure that they're posted to the website now so you all can find find them and follow up as desired. That would be very helpful. Okay, great Thank point, you. Carlin, because I, I also struggled looking on the website, looking for the, com or the complete packet just didn't have all the slides. Right. And I know sometimes things get tweaked at the last minute, but... Okay, you've heard it from us. Uh, Tarian, yes. We will follow up yeah. on that. Uh, yeah, so it was sent out Tuesday morning, um, like Stephanie mentioned later than we'd like to. Um, but at the same time, it is posted to the website, but you have to go to the actual meeting and then click on the HTML packet. Oh, and then okay. I post it under item four, regular agenda item, since it's a PowerPoint for the whole regular agenda item. So if you click on that, it okay. will... Um, bring up the attachments under, and then you can either view it or download it. Well, and it's funny because we all sit on so many boards and committees. Um, usually, I find it under complete packet, and I don't know how other people do, but that's sort of what happens with ABAG and with our county committees. So I don't know if it would be too difficult to transition to it, but maybe use that nomenclature. Nomen, I can't even talk tonight. Use that name. Use the name <laughs> You know, for a complete packet that would have all of the attachments in it. That would make it a little simpler. But. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for Thank being you. here. Anything else anyone has to say? If not, have a wonderful evening. Thank you for being here, and it was great to see all of you in person. Okay. Ah. <coughs> Good. Okay.